right. Uh, thanks for everyone who's joining us. We are at the uh, concluding of this chapter of Shape Virtual uh, Professional Development Workshops. Really, really exciting uh, to have Sarah Stevens here with us from Slice, uh, who's going to show us all about optimizing your online experiences. Mm -hmm. and so just sharing a lot of gratitude for Sarah, who is uh, doing that with us. We do have one more uh, Lunch with Leadership on Friday, if you join us on Friday. So I'm gonna pop it over to Sarah very soon. Um, I think everyone who is on here has been pretty familiar with at least the intricacies of the, the basic Zoom platform. And so I know personally, I'm really excited to learn some new tricks of the trade with Sarah today. So Sarah, I will hand it over to you. All right, hello everyone. I know we're an intimate group, but we will make the most of it and have a lot of fun with this. And hopefully my goal for you is just to give you a ton of tips and tricks. Um, so thinking of wearing maybe like two hats while you go about this, I'm, you're attending both the presentation, but also picturing yourself and how you would present and facilitate might be wise as well. So what I'm going to do is I have a presentation for you, of course, since it's regarding present presenting online. Um, so yeah, so I have a good amount of information, lots of different slides, lots of different resources, um, ways to interact and all of that. So we will go ahead and begin. Um, so what I, I was asked to do something along the lines of, of a Zoom, Microsoft Teams, um, virtual presentation of sorts. Uh, and the word optimizing really came to mind. I googled the word optimizing because though I use it, I'm honestly just wanted to double check that I knew what I what I was uh, discussing. And so um, optimizing means making the most of a particular situation. And I just don't know if there could be a better word for this period of time of what um, we might hope to achieve. And so it, it's what is most favorable or what is best. And so do know that what I'm sharing is the finest of details. If those of you who work in Slice and have worked with me know I love details. So I'll, I'll bring, it, uh, bring, bring up a lot of different ways to integrate even the tiniest little detail that can make all the difference. Um, I'm gonna share a lot of different free and paid options. Again, the word optimizing might come with some cost, but it doesn't mean you have to do that. And I have a lot of different ways to avoid that and try to utilize EDU pricing and uh, sneak through the system just a little bit. Um, yeah, so write down what works for you, what you think um, might help in a variety of different situations. So it could be presentations, it could be meetings, it could be facilitations, what have you. All right, so just briefly, Sarah Stevens, I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm the Senior Program Coordinator of Community Engagement and Student Staff Development in SLICE. And so I uh, do a lot with hiring. Sorry about that, I should have turned off my notifications. Um, that's, that's a good bit of advice for later. Um, I do a lot with hiring and onboarding, training development, recognition of student staff, but also um, large scale event programs like Cans Around the Oval and CSUV. All right, so we're gonna do a little bit of roadmap uh, just to give you a bit of context of how we're gonna go about Zoom today. So it sounds like you've been, many of you have already attended something like this before, but my goal is to really set the scene so you can get a sense of what you could do similarly. So audio, almost everybody comes in muted. It's a default option that most people would choose to get into Zoom. But silence isn't always golden. If you can think of a presentation in person when there's absolutely no feedback, no nonverbals, it's pretty awkward. And so when you can have your video on, it is useful. And then on top of it, when there's a prompting to engage or um, share out or speak up, um, if it's possible, then it would be helpful always for the presenter. So just to set the scene there. Um, Participants, so you're gonna see on your screen, there's gonna be some sort of menu. Mine's in the upper top area, but I'm not honestly sure if you can see it on the, on the shared screen. You would have something similar. You'd have audio in the bottom left on a computer. You'd have video, participants, chat, and then you might have video layout in the upper right corner. And so just to orient you some, a little bit further. Participants, so there's a lot of different ways you can interact with feedback. You can do like a little raised hand, you can, 
tell me to speed up, you can tell me to slow down, you can give me a lot of different direction that um, can be done through the participant section. Chat, you can put questions in there throughout. Um, I'm sure somebody might see the chat is going and there's a question and can interrupt me possibly. <laughs> um, and if not, I'll be checking chat as well and do questions at the end. And if we add, at any point, if I ask any sort of uh, what other resources work well for you or what other ideas do you have, if you share something and you can throw a hyperlink in this, into the chat feature, that'd be awesome as well. Uh, just to let you know, we are recording this, as Emily said, and I plan to share the PowerPoint out afterward. A video would also come out and I'll even do manual closed captioning, which I'll talk all about closed captioning later on, but wanted to let you know how, um, how accessibility is being handled, at least in this version um, today. And then video layout. So it's up to you what you wanna do. You could do speaker view, gallery view, that's in the upper right corner. Speaker view is you might see my face uh, or you might see the screen. Gallery view is the nice uh, mosaic that you can see everyone in the room. All right. All right, so just in keeping true to presentations that we do on campus or interactions we do on campus, um, Please just be mindful that the principles of community are at play. So those are inclusion, integrity, respect, service, and social justice. All right, so I wanted to give you some context of how I go about leading presentations and facilitations. If anyone's done strengths before, I am, I have the input strength and input is really like, I am an enormous sponge. I love, uh, all sorts of resources. I love ways that people speak and talk and do. I write it down. I take notes. I keep tabs. That might totally not be you, but my suggestion is, is that while you're still, while we're still operating in the virtual world and the virtual world is also really not going anywhere, take tabs on what is working and what you see fit and what is good, bad, and honestly pretty ugly out there. Um, I got a lot of ideas for this presentation, honestly, from Emily a bit, and Rachel, I love Mentimeter, we're going to utilize it throughout. Um, I got ideas from the Career Center, I attended their um, career, virtual career conference, just to get some, some new ways in which other, uh, others are presenting. I got it from websites, webinars, etc. So just be a sponge, inspiration is out there. All right, so this is how we're gonna go about today's session. So I'm gonna walk you through three different types of platforms that exist. Two, I think are way more common, Microsoft Teams and Zoom. And we're also gonna go over Google Meet and then get into some other differences and similarities there. We're gonna talk about what's actually some similar considerations that you would do in person. Um, and they're just being slightly adjusted and applied differently. Third, we're going to talk about when you should get yourself a sidekick and when you can be uh, flying solo and the pros and cons to each. And then finally, we'll round out with some virtual um, interactive delivery methods and actually when you can incorporate icebreakers and interactive means to get people to engage. So since you're joining this session and it hopefully was of interest, do know there's engagement opportunities throughout uh, and they'll be scattered and demoed. All right, so before we begin, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do Mentimeter. So if you all can pull out your phones if possible, or I think you can do it on a computer as well, you can go to menti.com. You're gonna type in this code here, and then I'll, I'll switch over the screen in a moment. You'll have your first question. All right, so the question is, who's joining us? If you don't mind sharing names, pronouns, and at least the area you work in, in the LSC. All right, Alma, we got one. That's exciting, yes. Good start. Solid, Adam, Rachel, lots of love of slice. Yes, yes, we'll try not to make it so slice centric. Beautiful. 
Juliet, thanks for going with the full sentence. Solid, like it. All right. Hello, Amber. Thanks for dealing with us slicers. We appreciate you. All right. Cool. I, I think that's it. I think that's our little bunch. And sorry, I didn't do it in real time. But again, Sarah, she, her, hers, I too work in that slice office. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to head on back to the presentation here. So choosing your preferred platform. I know Emily gets to see her face in double time. I'll, I'll tuck you away from there. All right, which is better? So let me give you some differences here. Uh, we have Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and Google Meet. I honestly don't know. I didn't know much about Google Meet until uh, pulling this presentation together. But I'll say that there's definitely some pros um, to bringing it in and, and little cons. So I wanted to incorporate it. So probably all of these at one time or another presented a learning curve to you. I don't think most of us were operating on any one of these um, much too long ago, but some of us were. So they come with a little bit of learning curves. Uh, they all have free and, and pro versions. Um, there's all educational pricing, which I looked into that makes things feel a little bit better. Depending on if you have a free version or you have a, a pro version, there are going to be time caps for um, amount of time in which you can utilize the software during a conversation. Um, and then they all have different varying participant sizes. So Zoom, I think, can take about 300 to 1,000, depending on what um, user type you have. Microsoft Teams can actually do up to 10,000 people for events, which is really cool. Um, and did not know that, but more about 250 for conference calls. And then Google Meet, I think, is in the, um, trying to remember. Yeah, that one's about 100 people or so. All of them have fun backgrounds, so get pumped about that if you have the capability of doing so and you don't look like a chameleon, <laughs> which is what I experience. All right, so let's compare some of the differences. Zoom. Okay, so the cool thing about Zoom is it integrates with pretty much any type of email provider you have. So where Teams is really specific to Outlook, Zoom is gonna work with Google, it's gonna work with, I guess, Yahoo, maybe AOL, if there's AOL users still these days, maybe, maybe. Um, it, I think it's honestly the most creative and most interactive. It has a lot of features to it that almost are as if you are in person, like the whiteboard effect is really cool. Um, lots of more in-person, real-time interaction. You can apparently have up to 49 users on screen, which is the most of any of these. But the drawback of Zoom is what's called Zoom bombing. Um, it's just that it's not as secure, but they're releasing a new platform um, that's the 5.0 version that should not have that effect. All right, let's talk about Teams. So the cool thing about Teams is they have a more integrated closed captioning option. Personally, as someone who is hard of hearing, I found that Teams is close to an it works. It works for me. It's better than what you see on YouTube. Zoom doesn't really have these features. It's more something an individual is doing or a third party needs to be incorporated. I also think Teams is best at file sharing, though you can do that on Zoom. Teams has a lot of different, you can upload all sorts of different types of files versus something that's more basic in Zoom. Um, apparently Teams is most secure. I think that's probably true, at least without the 5.0 version yet. Um, and it's just so much more integrated into um, software that's really built into an institution or organization. Integration with Microsoft Office, but the drawbacks at CSU would be that you would need an administrator to set it up for you initially. And it only really accommodates about four people on screen. So pretty basic there. All right, Google Meets, which I'm guessing is probably new for most folks. Um, so a couple things, there are pro and there are free versions, but up through this September the 30th, you actually can experience the pro version for free, which is pretty rad. It has this fancy feature that they're trying to compete with um, Zoom and Teams to essentially cancel out noise in the background. So if a dog is barking or drinking water, it apparently can erase that noise. 
it's integrated with Google. So obviously the Google is in its name. That makes total sense. Um, but I think the cool thing there is maybe for students, you if you have the, the CSU email that's attached to Google versus Outlook, that actually might be more fitting to communicate with fellow students. You can have a, up to 16 users on screen, which is nice, but it's not really the preferred platform at CSU. In other words, I have not heard this mentioned whatsoever. People aren't really utilizing it, but it's an option that's out there. All right, so one way we can do this bit of interaction is I'm going to ask that um, we think of other online platforms that are out there. So I'll go ahead and start that chat um, and we can put that in and I'll add it into the PowerPoint. What are other online platforms that you think can actually work in a presentation setting that you know of? Google Meets is the same as Hangouts. So actually, I learned Google Meets is part of Hangouts. It's like a, I think it's an extension of, maybe Hangouts I think kind of died out. It's kind of trying to bring it back. Yeah. WebEx. Megan, could you share more what WebEx is? Sure. Um, so one of my friends who works at Holland and Hart Law firm down in Denver. I know that that's the platform that they are using for a lot of their meetings. And then um, she's a board member of some kind of private school. Um, and so I think it just has a little bit more security maybe than Zoom in terms of the like less threat of being bombed um, and, you know, having to have more secure meeting passwords and double authentication. But overall, it is pretty similar to Zoom. Um, there's not the option for changing your background and that type of thing, but there's definitely the screen sharing and chats and file sharing available through it as well. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for sharing. How about go to meetings, Emily? I haven't heard that one. Uh, I got invited to one today and I couldn't figure it out past uh, logging in. So I think very similar to like Teams, or I'm sorry, well, Teams too, but Zoom, like it has an app you have to download. So it doesn't, I'm curious about like which one of these has the most easily accessible, like click and you're in. I actually think it might be Blue Jeans. I, I don't think that Blue Jeans has an app that you need to download to work at the optimal view and bandage, but I think the folks who are moderating or facilitating on Blue Jeans have to do more for the setup, but as a participant, it's pretty user friendly. So, um, yeah, those are just two other platforms that I know, but I am not as familiar with either of them. <laughs> Awesome. I'm going to share my screen again and share some others that um, I found as well. All right. If you've heard of Slack before, Slack is a, is a pretty cool app that I know a lot of the corporate world um, organizations utilize. It's like Trello mixed with a lot of other things. Um, apparently it has a similar feature. Skype, I guess, is that old school one that we all forget about. Um, but blue jeans definitely came up as being used pretty regularly. So thank you all for adding in. All right, so just some things to think about as you're going about selecting what platform is best for you. For you. So access and affordability, um, depending on what devices you use, um, that might really indicate what's best. Maybe um, if you have a tablet at home, Maybe Zoom is awesome for you because it has a whiteboard feature that might be um, something that's more attractive or not. Your internet and internet connection is something to think about. Um, I included my this little Xfinity image over here on the left here. And just to give some context, my partner works for the company and I've learned um, recently that all hotspots are free right now. And so if your internet isn't as strong, if you're able to find an Xfinity hotspot, um, it is pretty good internet that I've been able to, to utilize as well. So that might help you if you're doing a presentation and maybe an ethernet cord isn't nearby. Um, 
thinking of the different types of accounts, the cost associated, if you want to be a host or have administrative privileges, et cetera. So lots, of, lots to consider um, when it comes to platforms. The other is accessibility and adaptability. So some are better at subtitles than others. Some feature recordings um, that then allow, that go to a cloud that you can share the link out to later. Um, others, again, cut down on background noise. So really considering beyond what you need, but what the people that are joining you, um, the participants of your presentation, what accommodations can you provide? All right, so even though I asked you to share, um, share out a variety of different um, platforms that are of preference, I am gonna feature Zoom just because I've found personally that um, if you really want to make the most of your presentations, even through a free version, I think Zoom might be the best way to go, at least for now. Um, but I do think if you are really like trying to, if you have like an up, upcoming amount of presentations, there there's some perks to go about um, purchasing the pro version. It doesn't come at too much of a cost and the EDU version is still worthwhile. And I'm gonna give you some context as to why I think that's valuable. So I'll go over these um, and then I can show them and demo it real quick in Zoom. The perks of Zoom on the pro version is you can do breakout rooms. So if you're trying to lead a discussion and you have 100 people, you can break them out into groups of 20 and then it's a bit more manageable. Um, you can do that manually where you really in, in, uh, intentionally select and move people into rooms or you can do it automatically. That's really quick, which is nice. And then they can distribute into smaller rooms to discuss. Uh, closed captioning, again, you can ask and opt for somebody to take minutes or take, take uh, write down that information as it's coming out of someone's mouth. Um, and you can opt to add a third party onto it. With participants, you can do a lot more. You can invite people, you can mute, unmute, you get to hear. Unfortunately, sometimes it's annoying, but you get to hear a chime when someone joins in or, or exits out, which just kind of helps you manage the space and the folks in the room. Uh, you have that waiting room, which gives you a little bit pause to get ready. Um, and then there's a lot of different verbal and nonverbal communication that participants can have that you can adjust in the settings. You don't have to pay for Mentimeter or any of these other softwares that um, are add-ons. There is a polling option within, um, within Zoom, but the drawback there, it's more multiple choice and true false only. There's not really the option to do um, short answer type, type feedback. You can share the screen in a lot of different ways, though you can do that um, still through the free version. There's a, a couple more advanced options. And then the nice thing about recording is it can go to a cloud so it's not saved onto your computer. So there are some perks of going pro. So what my goal is here is to show you, um, I want to show you this whiteboard feature just because I think it is so valuable and is something that is just, I haven't really seen it anywhere else. That is interesting. Do you all see my backdrop right now of a succulent plant or do you, no, you do not. That's, that's great. I'm glad. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. You see that just a white screen possibly. Okay. Thank you, Rachel, for your head nods. They're super helpful. Okay. So that some cool things that you all can do. Anybody can do this for the whiteboard. Um, there's ways to draw onto the screen. Um, wow, my computer is having fun. Maybe, just know, you can totally draw on the screen. Every time I click on the screen, it's switching to another, another version. You can put stamps on there. You can type in comments. Somebody could upload an image onto the whiteboard and you can draw attention to something with the spotlight tool, kind of like a, a laser pointer. So there's lots of ways to interact on that screen. I apologize. I did not anticipate this, but I'll, I can demo other ways in which the whiteboard works. So that's a cool feature it has. All right, let's keep going. So some things to think about while you're setting up your presentations. Uh, um, oops. 
So let's talk about the preparation. So I want you to think of how you would still go about presenting virtually, even though it will be a little bit different, you're gonna to need to make some adjustments. So you wanna condense the information as much as you can, try not to read off of the slides. So I actually have a sticky note that says, look at me, and I stick it right next to my camera up above. So I'm actually looking at the camera and not the slides, which we'll talk about in a moment. But if you're able to see all the information on your slides versus maybe it's behind you in an actual room setting, you might find yourself really reading off of them. So condense that information. Keep stuff confidential. So if you have anything saved that you were reading last or it's on your desktop or some personal emails just came through, you might wanna start turn off your notifications and um, be mindful of what's kind of delete items, tuck them away, especially if you're sharing your screen and having to go back and forth between items. Um, and you'll be able to notice, like just looking at Mentimeter here, you all can see that, correct? Hey, Sarah, we're still on the whiteboard. Oh, that's great to know. I apologize for that. I learned, okay, great. Whiteboard is uh, extensive, okay. Sorry about that. Can you all see the presentation now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks for speaking up. Um, yeah, so let's keep going. So other things in preparation. So you wanna diversify your images, be mindful of stock images. You would do that in person, but um, really be mindful that there's not a, just a bunch of white people in your images. They're, those are the most commonly found stock photos and there's a lot of different ways to represent diversity in your presentation. Um, engaging, engaging presentations, so visuals, interactive elements we'll talk about in a moment. Knowing the size of the group, if any accommodations need to be made. Maybe you really do need to have closed captioning on because someone has expressed that they truly do need that to be able to be successful in the space. Prepping the space, so no, distract, no distractions, neutral background and avoid backlighting. So I have hardly any spaces in my house that's just white background because I'm, I'm, I uh, clutter everything and, and stuff is up on the walls. And so it's pretty hard to find that. And that's why I'm sitting on the ground in front of closet doors right now to try to give an example. Um, but be mindful, my dog is not near me. The lighting, I considered it before stepping in here. And then ch tech, check your tech. So uh, make sure you have that steady connection. Again, hotspots exist. Try to do so about 30 minutes prior. And then vary your devices. So if you have a computer, you have a phone, maybe you have a tablet, there's a lot of perks to honestly using them simultaneously. You just need to be mindful of audio is on in both screens. Um, but there's a lot of ways with Zoom to be able to draw on screen. And that's an example of the whiteboard again. So I think it's pretty cool. You could do it in real time and uh, almost make it as if you were in person doing a presentation. All right, so let's talk about personalization. So there's a few ways in which you can do that um, through all of the different platforms you use. Think about how your name is presented on the screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and take the, um, I'm gonna unshare here for a second. Uh, So if you're actually looking at the screen in kind of the, the speaker view or the, uh, the gallery style, you can start to see maybe there's some differences. I'll, I'll look at Adam for a second, his, his, his whole name on down below. And if you want, you could put a space in there. If you wanna put pronouns, there's a lot of different ways you can present yourself just by um, your name alone. And so how you would do that is you'd go down to participants on the bottom, and then you would go over to your name and go to more. And there's the drop down there and you can rename, you can change your profile picture. So that's one way of just the fine details of having some different forms of presentation. All right, back to the PowerPoint. Backgrounds, so there's, there's LSC backgrounds that Colab did, so snaps to them if you wanna incorporate that in. Canva, one of my favorite websites, which I'll talk about momentarily. They have a lot of cool backgrounds, which I know that uh, Rachel had some cool avocados as her background the other day. Um, but the cool thing about Canva is it's, they have a lot of cool animated backgrounds, um, but just be aware that that could be overwhelming or a bit distracting to people. But if you're doing a presentation about nature and you have a picture that's really thematic, you could put that in the background, but just be mindful of just how much color and how much is going on in the background, um, but it can still make you distinct and stand out. 
And then finally be personable and authentic. So it is less awkward when there are people on screen and you can actually see folks. I can get a reaction that Adam at least, at least looks interested. Juliet's smiling to, to assure me that I'm doing all right, maybe. Um, but you can kind of get a read from folks um, in that gallery view, but it can also be distracting. So depending on what your presentation is and maybe the formality of it, or if you really need to memorize something, consider where you place people um, in view just so that maybe they're not um, as much of that distraction. All right, so things to consider while in your presentation. You probably heard this before by now, but I would recommend wearing something that's confident, that you feel confident in up top, is true to your identity, um, but wear something totally comfy on the bottom because the likelihood is no one's gonna see that. Um, <laughs> Eye contact, so like I said, I use this sticky note. I put it right where my, my actual camera is and that's a little bit easier done on a phone. I tried to talk on Zoom yesterday on a tablet and it was honestly pretty hard for me because the camera was on the left and my, the angle was just so off. And so be aware of that even on your phone when you take pictures and selfies, in reality, we should be looking at the camera versus ourselves in the screen. Another good idea is you should determine what you're doing. Are you presenting? Are you facilitating? Are you actually giving a lecture? Um, presentation is more the style I'm doing. Facilitation would be more like group and team building and trying to reach shared goals. Um, but be mindful that when you're doing a presentation, you should, you should parson out how much of a lecture is actually occurring. So I call them lecturettes. I got that from uh, Association of Talent Development and association I'm a part of. They love lecturettes and what they are, they're just 10 minutes, little bite-sized lectures that are then broken up with other bits and pieces of interaction. So it doesn't feel like an hour's worth of just talking. Couple of things to realize. So I, I attended a couple uh, webinars recently and people owned up to not knowing technology and they were cool with being a bit um, having some humility, which was awesome because it was really authentic. I felt like I could relate to them. But at one point in a presentation, it got to a point that they started undermining themselves. And I, it was really hard to kind of focus after that point. So I think there's a lot of grace that comes with online presentations right now. And just don't kind of, don't put your down, yourself down too much that you lose control of the group. Setting the scene and ground rules. So I mentioned that at the beginning, I gave kind of an overview and oriented you the space. You would want to do the same. Principle, principles of community was used in the career, um, the career conference I attended. I liked what they did there and brought those in. That might be a good way of setting um, some initial ground rules of how people should interact with folks. Speech. So you wanna enunciate, particularly on these virtual um, interactions, speak a bit slower than usual. If you're getting breathless, which is sometimes me, um, you just need to take a deep breath, slow it down a bit. And it's all right if you're going a bit slower. People appreciate being able to hear each individual word versus it just strung together, especially if they're not necessarily looking at the screen. And for those who read lips, really be mindful to not um, cover up your mouth at this point. And then timing. So practice has always been important and being aware of time. I would recommend you don't have your phone near you, but you should have a clock nearby so you know just how, how how well you're doing based off of time. And then the other thing I think that's useful um, as a skilled presenter is be flexible. So if you don't get to all your screens, be able to wrap it up and still feel like you've given a solid um, presentation. And if you're able to get through everything, that's cool as well. And then the last thing is use names and pronouns if you know them. So if that's been presented, either again on their individual profile or you need know folks individually, that kind of can snap people out of the Zoom fatigue that many of us are having um, and it brings everybody in. And I think that helps with um, feeling like people are all on the same page. All right, how are we doing? Breathe in, thumbs up, you can clap it out. I see some of you, I don't see others, that's totally fine, solid. Okay, doing well. Thank you, Amber, solid thumbs up action. Well done, well done. All right, so let's talk about sidekicks or flying solo because I think this is honestly really important and, and, and some of it is, is uh, 
it could be preferable, but it's not realistic. So that's why I wanted to give you some differences here. So there are benefits to having sidekicks. And I'll say that yesterday, I'm a part of the LSC uh, graduation committee that Emily, Emily chairs, and um, she did a great job with sidekicks. So shout out to, to her here. So there's two of us, one, I'll be doing, I'll be typing in closed captioning in real time. Somebody else is gonna be doing the chat box moderator. Um, they'll kind of be able to share documents. Maybe let's say if, if Emily's computer fails, there's a lot of different ways that an extra person who's in the know of your presentation can help you out. So they could either be a co-host like Emily is right now and she let y'all in um, past that waiting room. I didn't have to do that and it was at ease. Um, they might laugh at your jokes, which might be useful, especially if you're getting some less than uh, desirable feedback from others. Um, or, and hopefully they're actually paying attention the whole time, especially if they're checking the chat box, you would hope that you at least have one actively engaged human with you. Um, good for tech support if they're savvy with the system. And then they're your support system, which I think is really useful because this is all new territory. And honestly, I think we could all use a little bit more grace at times. All right, I appreciate the cue timed laugh. Hashtag, yes, thanks, Emily. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's helpful when, you're, when you have other people, but that's not necessarily something you can default to, especially if you're doing a group presentation in a class and you're graded individually for your effort. And so I wanted to share what I was prepared to do. So sometimes it's just you. Definitely do not cover your mouth because it's pretty darn hard to do subtitles simultaneously and type while speaking. And since that's not likely going to happen, be at least mindful to, again, enunciate and then make sure your mouth um, area is at least viewable, even though there's the shared screen. So keep in mind that people might be using speaker view and whatnot as well. Do give notice that you are recording, and then once the recording's done afterward, um, especially if it's on Zoom, it'll send you a link, which is cool, and then you're able to upload that to YouTube, and then you can adjust closed captioning. For instance, uh, YouTube does not understand Lori Student Center. It spells Lori in a really funny way, and there's just some, like, there's nuances that you want to go back in and adjust. And then again, give yourself some grace just because this is all new um, learning curve and I think people all get it because they've been there or they're avoiding it as long as they can. I am definitely not gonna read these best practices out. I know it's super lengthy, but I just wanted to share what is considered best practices if you are being ADA compliant um, to be able to in integrate those into presentations. So the Americans with Disabilities Act came out with probably a lot more than this, but I did find these best practices to be really useful. So anything from using Helvetica to having a black background so it pops, how you integrate music in, what else can you provide besides in real time um, closed captioning. So there's closed captioning in the platform you may use, but there's also closed captioning um, available when you record something and upload it later. All right, last section, here we go. So virtually interactive delivery methods. Um, what I want you all to start thinking here is how can you take what you have experienced before that was effective? A stellar icebreaker, a really good way of presenting material not in lecture form, um, and think of how you can adjust it in such a way that it can still totally operate at least um, similarly in the interactive virtual world. So here's some ideas and we'll get back to Mentimeter. So again, if you can pull that up on your phone or um, computer, menti.com, that's the code again. We will pop on over. I guess I should continue sharing my screen. Sorry about that, let's see. All right, so this one is more Wordle style, I think. I don't know, we'll find out, I can't remember. Um, but go ahead and type in your, your ideas. Why do you think virtual interactions might be valuable in online presentations? Uh, 
I'm trying not to talk while you're typing, but I'll go ahead and share some out now. So engagement's more apparent, um, engaging the audience. It encourage, it's good encouragement for the facilitator, definitely true. If there were no boxes up here, that would be pretty awkward. Um, showing folks are present and engaged, still able to connect with one another. Yes, so this could be like a sticky note activity in person. Um, it could be a four corners activity while everyone has a marker and goes around and writes things into a question. Lots of different ways um, that Menti can be used as a virtual form of interaction um, that hopefully you all see that it's just not me talking. So let's get back to that presentation. So here are some other ideas I thought of um, in addition to, I think the nice thing about virtual interaction is it's can you all see this, the presentation screen? Nope. We're still on Menti, Sarah. Clearly, I am uh, not the best at sharing screens, but we are getting there. All right. How are we doing now? PowerPoint? Yes. Yep. Thank you, Adam. Awesome. When I hide your faces so you don't see, so I don't see you, I don't, uh, I don't know where you all are at. Okay, let's go backwards here. All right, so some things to keep in mind. So it's adaptable to, to all sorts of different size groups. You can choose the type of interaction, even for 100 people, they could easily do the cloud, um, word clouds, or just like we did on Menti. If it was more um, a smaller size group, you could do some sort of like virtual share out, um, lots of different ways to go about it. I think it does work with a completely new group where folks don't know each other, and it works with people who definitely know each other for a long time. And the reason why I think it's effective either way is it combats what I'm calling the ground, Groundhog Day effect, which I think others can probably relate to. We probably all have kind of this Zoom fatigue or we've done so many virtual interactions that if something isn't quite different or creatively done, um, other than how it's been before, we can just get into this mode of not really paying attention, multitasking, and it just doesn't, I think, uh, seep in as well. And so that's, I'm trying to get away from that, and I think that's, that's a benefit. It reduces what's called virtual fatigue, which I'm sure probably all of us have experienced so far. I learned this yesterday called the 202020 process, and so you should be spending 20 minutes of time on your computer or with a phone or tablet, essentially that virtual interaction. And then you take a 20 second break and you look 20 feet away from you. <laughs> and that's supposed to help with your fatigue. And so if you can try to get your, the folks in your presentation to do something similarly, like if you can get them to go retrieve something in their home that gets them away from the computer screen for a moment, and then it allows them that 20 second break within 20 minutes of the presentation. The other things that I think are valuable is it sets the tone from the beginning. If you have a bunch of serious people and you put something fun and playful at the beginning, people are gonna take themselves less seriously and are likely a bit more able to engage. It's harder to do that when you don't see people. Um, I used to say for in-person facilitation, if you don't, if baring your teeth, so if you are in an elevator, picture yourself in an elevator, last time you were in an elevator, if you can imagine what other people did when you got into the elevator, the likelihood is they did something like this type of smile. No teeth showing, eyes looking down, the forced smile, like I have to interact, but get me out of here. Um, that does not show vulnerability at all. But if you do bare your teeth, I'm not saying like aggressively, um, and not to say you have to smile, but if you're able to just like break your lips a little bit, that alone helps with showing sense of vulnerability and that sets the tone. So that's, it's very similar um, in that regard is, is not taking yourself too seriously. And it varies the voices. I know we haven't as much done um, voice interaction, but even in the beginning hearing from Megan and Emily really started to not have it just take its toll on me and I might be getting pretty boring to your ears. Some considerations though, when it might not make sense or you might need to adjust in a way is the seriousness of the topic versus the playfulness of the activity. 
if you're doing something so off the wall and silly, but then you have to talk about something that is just so darn intense and hard that those do not really align. And so you would want to think of adjusting to make sure your activity is intentional, not just something that you've seen several times before. And then time constraints. That's another big one to be aware of. Menometer is good because it could just be 30 seconds to a minute. If you did breakout rooms, it could be up to 20 minutes. It just depends um, depending on, on time. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over some of my favorite types of online tools that I found really useful for online presentations. And just note that pretty much all of, all of these work in person too. So Canva, that is my oh, most favorite. So I love this, I love this website. I studied art at CSU. I took graphic design courses and Canva is so much cooler than anything I could do in the period of time that it gets it done in. So it's easy to use. They have all sorts of beautiful, engaging presentation slides. They're really rad stuff. They make avocados cool. I, uh, yes, uh, Rachel, Rachel knows that. Mm -hmm. Uh, very versatile. I've made birthday cards on there. I've, apparently you can do social media posts. I've also made business cards on there. Lots of different ways you can use it. And again, they have Zoom backgrounds or, or any platform background that is. And they have animative qualities, which is new in its beta form. I really like that. I think that's really unique and, and it really will set itself apart. And they have three different versions of free an in-between paid version and a really professional version. That gives you access to tons of different designs, fonts, et cetera. I'll demo each of these really quick at the end, but we'll go through them first now. Mentimeter, okay, so you've already experienced that already. Easy, I think, fairly easy, fun. And the nice thing about it, it's anonymous. So how you do it is you kind of create and set up the questions as you go ahead of time. It's accessible. I should have added on a computer as well. There are free and paid versions, but the drawback, I think the only drawback that I've found is that you can't pay for a monthly subscription, at least what I could find, but I didn't spend very long on it, so it's possible they, they might have something there. And if you've ever experienced Pull Everywhere, that one's been around for quite some time. I think Mentimeter is a bit cooler, has some color to it. It has a bit more of a new, newer feel to it. All right, Slide Carnival. This one I learned only a couple weeks ago from our grad student in the Slice office, Sydney. She, she similar to Canvas, or sorry, similar to Canva, we could totally create our own type of presentation backgrounds, but to save time, Slide Carnival is awesome for PowerPoints. So this presentation I'm using right now is from Slide Carnival, and there's a lot of different themes by color um, as well. And what I like is you can do a lot of different types of customization if you want, and you want the time, or you don't have to do that. So lots of different options. YouTube, I thought this was a given. You're probably really uh, knowledgeable about YouTube, but I think it's worth mentioning that when I'm done with this presentation, I can upload it to YouTube and I can put subtitles on it and it can be translated into 15 different languages. And so there's a lot of ways to use YouTube besides just pulling in a TED talk. And the other nice thing about videos, whether it comes from YouTube or not, is they take off the stress of presenting in real time and give you a break as a facilitator. Um, so keeping in mind the versatility of that. And then the last one I added is Zoom's whiteboard feature again. It is good with a stylus and tablet. It works on a computer um, and it probably works decently well on a phone. I've done it with my finger as well. Um, but I think, I think all of these have their different um, perks and features. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna demo um, my, all these real quick, just so you can see them in real time. Are you all seeing Canva? Okay. So yeah, the cool thing about Canva, they have all sorts of things. Apparently you can even make shirts now. Um, lots of cool different backgrounds. And I'm able to make something at like our slice into the year celebration. I've made cards, I've made presentations, lots of different options. All right, next one is Slide Carnival. Like I said, um, I found it pretty useful to go through these different types up top, formal, inspirational, creative. The cool thing is, is once you download and you find your ideal presentation, it'll also tell you what the font is and give you a free version of the font to download as well. So it's easier to uh, manipulate. 
And then the other cool thing I found with my download is it gives you all these cool images that are created again. So you can just copy and paste them in and they even have emojis in there um, just to keep things a little bit more fun and fresh. All right, let's see if I can get there. YouTube, so YouTube, I know you've probably all been on YouTube before, but the one thing I wanted to draw your attention to is YouTube now has what's called Studio. And the difference there is if you upload videos into Studio, it allows you to do a lot more with making subtitles here on the left than I used to be able to do before Studio was created. So there's a lot more features and ways to interact and edit your, your videos, um, where before you'd have to go over to your account, get into your channel, and it was a lot of backdoor approaches. So just wanted to show you that distinction. Okay, and Playmio is the one I'm gonna show you here in a moment. So I'll go ahead and stop that for a sec. How are we doing? Just a few more minutes remain, powering through? Okay, solid. It looks like it's all sliced, so I'll just keep keep the <laughs> keep the slice comments going okay here we go just some other ideas to keep in mind just for the sake of time we won't break it out but some other virtual methods you could think of as zoom breakout rooms could work panelists you could have in terms of um bringing in other voices however i did attend a panelist um webinar recently and I think something to keep in mind if you have panelists is don't go in the same order every time. The person that always got to start always had the best answer. Then the next person was kind of picking up the pieces and every time it got to the fourth person, you could tell they felt rather defeated and didn't feel like they had much to add. And so I, I think an organic flow to panelists would be much better than, than trying to, to make things too organized. Though organization helps online, you have to bring it back a little bit to the more, um, to something that feels a little bit more, it's, it's a bit more equitable to the people on the panel. So, all right. All right, so we're gonna go back, I think, to Mentimeter. What icebreakers do you think could be used, could be virtualized? So I want us to just think of a few real quick. Um, I'm gonna remind you of what, makes a good icebreaker, something that's fun, universal, playful, is not being forced upon you, something that isn't threatening since it's at the beginning and you're trying to just break down any sort of barriers. It's interactive, lots of entry points. It is simple to understand, so very little explanation. And then finally, it's success oriented. Even though it's not a team builder per se, there isn't necessarily a way to fail in an icebreaker. And that comes from Mark Hollard, who's one of my favorite people um, that I've seen present many times before. And we'll talk about Playmio, his website, in a moment. Um, but this comes from his book, Serious Fun. So let's go to Mentimeter one more time. All right, so just popcorn style it out. What different types of icebreakers do you think would actually work virtually online? <laughs> yes, show and tell, good, let's keep it going. <laughs> Awesome. Breakout room, silly questions, home goods scavenger hunt. Love that. That's cool. Um, saying random facts, fun questions, name games. 
show and tell we obviously did in slice cool awesome all right so i'll just oh solid fun fat, fun questions let's see build a story oh that's so cool yeah or maybe like telephone style that's pretty creative yeah awesome okay so we're gonna head back to this presentation and just wrap up here I, I did cover a few, just the other ones to think in, think about as well. Like, yes, all these different Q and A type questions, like what brought serotonin to you today? Or what's your weird, something new you learned? You could show it maybe like in a screenshot feature or a selfie, not just like saying it out loud. And you could integrate that into the chat as well, or put it up into your, um, your screen. Playmeo is a website I do wanna make note about um it's full of all sorts of different online uh, well it's full of all sorts of different ways to interact and do team building and interactive games in general it's not something that has always been made for virtual world and lately they've been able to update um, a lot of their material to be able to do such so it's cool when you go in there you can search by activity type size of group physical, mental um, activity level. You can search by learning outcomes or step-by-step -step instructions, video demos, all sorts of things. In Slice, um, we do have a paid subscription. Um, as long as you're in Slice, you're, you're able to access that. Um, but this is just another resources that, that I wanted to present. There's so many ways to turn your materials virtually. Um, and I think it's worth taking an extra look at things that have always been a resource for you in person and seeing if have they updated it. And is it actually a pretty legit source now for the world we're all experiencing. So with some creativity, we can move from this type of interaction to this one where you can answer prompts. What is getting you through this unique time, which for me was cookie butter for a long period of time but thankfully i've stopped because that was a really bad habit <laughs> but it was awesome for a few weeks anyway those were the topics that we covered so choosing your own platform same considerations that applied in the past can be applied differently now um, getting yourself a sidekick or going solo and then virtual interactive delivery methods so the very last Mentimeter I have, you get to tell me what topics you like the best. If you can just head on over one more time. And I'll share this screen again since I'm getting savvier at it. Let's see. What did you find most intriguing? Just wanting to show you how you can do Mentimeter, not as a word bubble or, um, an open-ended question. All right, no one gives a crap about online delivery methods. Okay, no, maybe some people care. All right, cool, awesome. All right, we're at time. So I appreciate you all. I know this was not necessarily, I'm sure you have a lot of other stuff going on during this week, um, but I really appreciate you sticking through it. And hopefully you did learn something. Um, I learned a ton of putting this together. So I hope you're walking away with, or heading out with, with a few more ideas. So thank you. Sarah, thank you so much for uh, that very informative per usual presentation. Uh, thanks for Rachel for moderating the chat. Uh, thanks to all of you who are able to be here. I know one or two had to drop off. Um, the attendance link will be in the chat bar. So make sure that you uh, can fill that out and we'll notify supervisors. We hope to see folks on Friday for the last one. Um, and if it's relevant to you at the Lori Student Center graduation event, it's happening tomorrow at four. Uh, so we're gonna stop recording now and bye everyone.